Today we are discussing Genuine Parts Company, ticker GPC. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts on the valuation of this company and its business quality. We see the market cap is 23 seven billion dollars enterprise value of 26 billion dollars so you see about two and a half billion dollars in net debt on this business so a little less than 10 percent of the enterprise value which is not a ton on this distribution business they distribute automotive replacement parts industrial parts and materials has an automotive parts groups um, and industrial parts segments automotive parts are for both hybrid electric vehicles trucks suvs buses motorcycles recreational vehicles etc so basically Everything that moves has an industrial replacement parts segment, such as bearings, mechanical, electrical power transmission products, um, hydraulics, maintenance repair, um, basically all sorts of industri industrial products. So distribution businesses tend to be pretty interesting. A lot of times what's good about a distribution business is you're distributing small parts into a much larger, higher value item, which means that you can probably get a pretty good price on the product because what's key is the convenience and the availability of the product and not as much about the price because you usually need to be back online quickly, especially if these are revenue products or if it's like an automobile and you're driving you need to be back on the road as quickly as possible so what matters is the distribution it's available on time when it's needed and where it's needed and less so much the price so you have a little bit of pricing power sometimes in these types of businesses um, and you'd get some benefits for having more scale than your competitors return on invested capital chart tells us a few things it looks like they lost money in 2020 which is not surprising that was a particularly bad year for the automotive industry there were a lot of part shortages so it wouldn't surprise me that they lost money in that year but that is the only year that they lost money in the last 20 years and in addition we can see that they basically had 19 years of profitability out of the last 20 very good numbers the year they had 18 in a row you know 2003 to 2019 and for the most part, the return of us to capital is staying between this 10% mark and the 20% mark. You're earning very strong returns on invested capital. It's very stable. It doesn't look cyclical at all. You do have some ups and downs, but year to year, you don't have significant changes. In fact, it looks like steady improvement for the most part is the norm from year to year. Now, they did have some deterioration from 2016 down into this tro in 2020. This could be the start of some sort of cyclicality in the business going forward, but I'm not anticipating that from what I see. It looks like in general, they're maintaining a very strong set of numbers between 10 and 20%. This is exactly where I'd want my return on invested capital to be at sort of that minimum level. You see that 10 year median returns, 14.7% return on invested capital, 21% return on equity. These are very good numbers. I really want to hit a 10% number here, 15% number here, and you're meeting those very easily. And that provides you the capital you need, the returns you need to be able to self-fund your growth. And so that means you're not going to need to take on a lot of debt in order to grow. You're not going to need to have a lot of dilution in order to grow. That's very good. So now we need to get into valuation and growth rates. Valuation is a PE of 20. This is a relatively high PE ratio for an average company, but this is clearly a high quality business. Everything here is showing high quality business, 19 years of profitability, very good returns on capital. So we have a high quality business at a relatively high price. Average prices for S&P 500 company, PE of 15, PE of 20 is a relatively high, about 30% higher than that. Um, with your PE of 20. Does it mean it's necessarily overvalued? It could be fair value for a high quality business, but it's certainly not cheap. It's not undervalued at this price, especially when we think about our growth rates. You see a PE of 20 is about an earnings yield of 5%. You combine that with a 5% revenue growth rate, you get five plus five, you get 10, right around that point where you could get a double digit return on capital, double digit return, which is exactly matching what you'd expect from a general S&P 500 company. So nothing surprising there, but we're not looking at market beating returns based upon these sorts of numbers. You do see assets are growing faster than revenue, free cash flow, and EPS. That tends to be a sign we're going to have relatively lower returns on capital across the decade. And it's what we see here, of course. 2012, you had 18.9% returns. Now you have 16% returns. So just that slight decline. You wouldn't want to see it continue forever because it's going to be further declines in the future. But based upon what we're seeing in their history, that's not necessarily what I would expect. You know, they have some ups and downs, but generally they've been getting good returns. 7% um, EPS growth rate is better than the revenue by about one and a half to 2% 2, 2 per year. Um, that could come from buybacks, which we're going to, you know, take a deeper dive on. But 7% basically means you're going to double your earnings over the course of a decade which is about what we see here. You went from $4.40 to $8.31. It's a pretty reasonable amount. You see that they are getting some operating leverage because revenue didn't double you know, 14 to 22, so it's up about 50, 
but your gross profit did better than your revenue and your operating profit did a little bit worse and your gross profit's only up about 60%. Let's see, anything else of note? This 2020 number we're gonna have to dive a little bit deeper on as well. Uh, it did look like they had an operating profit, so that is a good sign. So it's probably debt that put them into the negative category. Um, all good so far. Everything is looking really strong. Um, reasonable growth rates. You'd want to be just a little bit higher if you could, but 5% puts you in that upper end of the single digits instead of the lower end. So it's good to see that part as well. If you're enjoying this video, if you're learning something, please hit that like button. Great way to tell YouTube you're enjoying my content. Even if you don't like this particular company, that's what I need you to do to help me grow this channel. So please support me with your likes. So income statement. An important thing with a company like this only growing at the single digits is you need to see their SG&A management. You see they've gone from $3 billion to $5.7 billion, so they've only doubled their SG&A. It's not really providing a lot of operating leverage over the gross profit. It's kind of growing in line with gross profit growth. You'd like to see it grow slower than gross profit growth so you could really boost your operating profit numbers, but we're not able to see that here. You do see net interest income, but that's not the driving force for why they had negative results um in 2020 because income tax played a role here and it's this was only a hundred million dollars of net interest income they still had a pre-tax profit um so it's really this non-operating income looks like they had some sort of write down here i'm not at all concerned about it what's really important is they had a positive pro operating profit they had a positive pre tax income even post interest so that means the business was certainly stable I would just kind of mentally in my head revise this that they have 20 straight years of profits. That's how I would think about this. Just kind of confirming this is a high quality distribution business. Um, EPS. You can see they started with 156 million shares outstanding. They ended with 142. So they've retired about 10% of the shares outstanding over the last decade. That's going to add about 1% per year to the EPS growth. So what we're going to see here then is you say... 1% of the 2% gap here is coming from the share buybacks from going from revenue of five and a half to six and a half. And then the remaining 0.7, 0.8% is coming from a little bit of operating leverage, not a ton, but just a little bit. And that's allowing you to get that doubling of earnings every decade. So let's go to the balance sheet. So we said their earnings doubled about it every, you know, each decade, but they've kind of forex their PP&E. So their PP&E is a lot more capital intensive. That kind of drives in what I said before, you had this growing asset base. And so the assets are growing faster than EPS and revenue. That's what you're seeing here is that you're having this balance sheet grow on the PP&E side much faster. Likewise, you're growing your inventories um, decently fast, but not as fast. Um, but that goes into the overall lower returns on invested capital because you have that many more assets, but you're not earning as much on the income as fast. Likewise, you went from basically having no debt at the beginning of the decade to now supporting $3 billion in long-term debt. So that is one key factor here as well. Um, that $3 billion is now more in debt than your total PP&E. It's a little bit of concern. It means now you're starting to put debt on the inventory. Um, it means the business is just a little bit more leveraged. And you, I don't really understand why you need that. Um, you're earning a pretty respectable return on invested capital. Um, it does get your return on equity into the 20% range, which is really attractive. So as long as they can still manage to manage uh, do well with their SGNA and they can continue to grow, this won't be a problem. There's nothing concerning about this long-term debt amount. It's basically two years of earnings. That's perfectly reasonable for an amount of leverage. No problem there, but it's just, you know, you can't necessarily continue that growth over time. So it's like how much of that was important for the recent growth. I do say that they had an acquisition here in 2016, 2017, and you see this jump in goodwill and intangible assets. So that big jump here where you went from 8.8 .8 billion in assets to 12.4 billion in assets is where this debt came from. This is where the big jump in debt came from. $2 billion in debt, you took on about at least $2 billion in assets here. You can see that jump that matches out. Um, Obviously, what's great about financial statements is they tell the story of the business. You don't have to know anything about the business. You can learn it all in these 10, 15 minute looks because the balance sheet will tell you what's going on. So cash flow statement, see a big change in working capital in 2020. Important thing here, of course, again, confirming that that one year wasn't really a problem. You had positive cash flow from operations every single year. You didn't really lose money that year that you had the write down. 
It looks like they have buybacks every single year. I always like to see buybacks every single year, but they do have stock-based compensation. Now the buybacks are much bigger than stock-based compensation, which is why you're not being diluted. You're still retiring shares. I don't really know why this company needs stock-based compensation. Um, this, I, to me, this is something that should stick to the tech industry. I wish it'd go away everywhere, um, but it just kind of complicates this complicates the story a little bit. And you can see this debt issuance here matching up with the acquisition, which we talked about before. Um, PP&E investment is lower than, is basically in line broadly with your depreciation. In some cases, a little higher. It kind of jumped up higher than the PP&E investment after the acquisition, which makes sense as well. Um, dividends paid every year. Buybacks paid every year. Everything makes sense here. You see another big acquisition right at the end of this 2020 in 2022. So that's going to impact going forward, kind of like how things look. Something to be aware of. Um, you want to understand how much money and how often management is going to make acquisitions. Looks like they've done two big acquisitions in this decade, but they're really making acquisitions every single year. And that can impact, you know, how effective the management is doing it. What do these acquisitions do? Are they acquiring new products? Are they acquiring, you know, warehouses or distribution? Where is that going? And so you really understand because that's really hard to assess returns on capital when you look at acquisitions. If there were no acquisitions, it's really easy to say, hey, the business is earning what the return on capital is. You have good returns on capital here, so you want to have that sort of reinvestment. But as they've made more and more acquisitions, we've seen that fall off, it has recovered some. So it's just something to be aware of. Are those acquisitions you know, really being the positive driving force So you want them to be in this business? And how can that play out in the future? That's gonna take a deeper look into like management's philosophy. You wanna probably wanna read some earnings call transcripts and of course read the 10K to get a better idea there. I think this business is very, very interesting. Um, it's definitely a high quality business. It's trading at the price that you expect many high quality businesses to trade at these days. PE of 20 is perfectly reasonable. You combine that with 5% revenue growth and you can instantly see how you can get that 10% return. Five plus five, 10% there. If you start to do it from EPS, you could say, hey, maybe you can get up to 12% return. Um, you got dividends thrown in there. So what's our dividend yield? You know, 358. Um, 165, so you're about at that 2% dividend yield. You know, if you do 2% dividend yield plus 7% growth rate, maybe you're at a 9% return. So all these numbers are right in the ballpark of what the S&P 500 has historically returned. Now, personally, I'm thinking that S&P 500's returns are gonna be worse than they were historically, which might mean that you could get a better than beating S&P 500 return with this type of company. Does it go on my watch list? I think this one's borderline. I like the numbers from the return on capital. This is definitely a high quality business. Um, the revenue growth is just a little low. If the revenue growth was 8%, I think this would be on my watch list. I like distribution companies. They ha tend to have a pretty good moat. It's hard to get into distribution. And so if you already have a strong distribution business, it can be a very good business to have. But I think for me, it's just a little bit low on the revenue growth. Very strong returns here. It's able to self-fund their their capital. They do have a little bit of operating leverage. They're executing buybacks. They're paying a dividend. There's a lot to like in this business. Maybe interesting for many of you. For me, I just have a little bit higher revenue growth that I want to see before making an investment. So for me, I'm going to pass. I hope you learned something from this video. Hit that like button. Don't forget to become a subscriber. That's the best way to support this channel is be a subscriber. Follow along with the content. If you want to see the companies that met all of my standards to hit my watch list, check out the playlist at the top. Those are my watch list companies that I have found to be the best stocks I've found in the SP 500. I hope you will check those out. And if you want to learn how to use software like this, great way to support the channel, quickfs.net. The affiliate link that I have is the first link in the description below. You need to use my link so that you can let them know that you came from me. Free or paid account, doesn't cost you anything extra to use my link, but it's a great way to support the channel because I get a commission if you end up making an account. Thank you for listening. And until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.